Welcome to the GridMod Pod, brought to you by AEIC. In this podcast, you'll hear from the utility industry's top operations leaders on how their companies are working to modernize and improve our ever-evolving power grid. Thanks for joining us. Hello, and welcome to the GridMod Pod. I'm your host, Dr. Elizabeth Cook. And so today we're diving into, again, the fascinating world of grid modernization and the transformative journey of all of our energy systems. And so joining me is a special guest with a wealth of knowledge and experience in the field. So it's Mickey Derrick. He is the managing director in Accenture's North American Utility Practice Office. So Mickey, please take a moment to introduce yourself to our audience. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I I have actually followed your podcast for a while, hoping that at some point I will give it get a chance to talk to you and I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to I'm super excited to be here and uh, look forward to, to a good conversation. Just a little bit of my background. I have been around the industry for about 20 years now, uh, mostly in the consulting side, so uh, advisory services. And as you said, I'm at Accenture right now. I've been there for here for seven years. Uh, I was with Davies Consulting, which is a small boutique uh, consulting company uh, focusing on utilities for about 20 years and uh, joined Accenture to acquisition. Most of my experience has been uh, with utilities on the operational side, uh, strategy business, reliability, asset management, grid modernization. Uh, you know, how do we prepare the grid for all the transformation that is coming down the road? So uh, looking forward to, to, to having a good conversation with you about all the different challenges that we're dealing with as an industry. Yes. Thank you, Mickey, for the, taking the time. It's truly an honor to have someone of your caliber on the show. And so we're going to explore a few uh, areas because as some of our listeners are realizing, the grid modernization topic is quite expansive. So as you said, just the challenges of integrating you know, new edge uh, technologies, as well as just new energy resources that are becoming available, which means they're becoming affordable and scalable. So therefore now, you know, it's an opportune time to use that innovative uh, research for the last d- couple decades. Right. So now we have new gadgets and gizmos, aka wind, solar, battery energy storage, that wants to connect to the grid, right? So really talk about the current transmission and distribution systems relative to the capital investment requirements for that modernization, which, you know, we read about it, we hear about it, we feel it. It's quite a lift. And then just how these changes really will impact that ultimate customer affordability and then the overall utility operations. So, oh, and I think we're going to touch base on that fun word resiliency. What is resiliency and what does it mean to each individual or your perspective? So here, I'm going to throw up our first question to you, Mickey. You know, what are and what do you see as the main challenges that utilities are facing with this new technology that wants to connect to our existing grid infrastructure? And what are some strategies you can speak of or experienced to overcome them? No, absolutely. I, you know, we, we often say, you know, we have all these smart technologies that are coming on and not to be derogatory, but we have a little bit of a dump grid, right? Especially on the distribution side. And one, one of the reasons is that a lot of the infrastructure that we have was built back in the 70s, right? So we have aging infrastructure. Uh, we have changing climate conditions. Uh, we can debate it whether it's... Uh, how it's coming about, but but the fact is that we have a lot more uh, large events uh, all across and different kinds of events. I mean, anything from uh, from wildfires to hurricanes to ice storms and you know thunderstorms and derechos that we've had uh, as well. So there are all these different environmental uh, pressures on on the, on the grid. You know, in some areas uh, they have been because of the load increases have been able to re rebuild that grid, and we can see how it's performing a lot better. You know, in Florida, after 2004, five hurricanes, they've had the very favorable uh, treatment to to actually go and rebuild a lot of the infrastructure. And you can see even in some of the recent hurricanes that grid has performed extremely, extremely well. But in some other areas, uh, you don't have that kind of load coming in. And we have, you know, all these assets that have been there for for a long time. But there are pockets of customers that want to participate in this a green revolution, right? And a transition into renewables, uh, but they're still fed off of this aging infrastructure. And most of the distribution system is is one way, right? From a central uh, generating unit to, to the customer. And if you want to start integrating renewables, uh, we have to enable a two-way 
uh, flow of, of energy, which requires us to completely uh, rethink how the distribution system. Uh, and often we, we say the, the distribution system actually needs to start behaving as a transmission system uh, does exactly. in, in many ways. It's like my. Which, yeah. So we've done it before, which requires right. investment in sensoring and measuring equipment, communication networks, and gathering the data to right. really provide, you know, insights to really how we can take action. But, right. Anyway. But it also re requires us to invest in building up, you know, bigger uh, wire, putting telecommunications capabilities into our, into our system. Uh, rebuilding, you know, for resiliency standpoint, you know, a lot of the people now are working from home, right? So they're expecting the, the reliable power and they're expecting also that if they're generating, they can sell it into some, s s some market. And then what we're not even thinking about is some of these renewable resources at the, if you look at it, like a, if you can sectionalize a grid and make it a microgrid during a big storm, you can actually use them to restore some of the pockets of customers that otherwise may be out for many days. But that all requires the, the infrastructure that it's on to be upgraded to a certain level. And a lot of those devices uh, need to start operating you know, in two ways. So the fuses are probably a, a limiting factor in being able to push that, that energy you know, two ways, just in, as, a, as an example. So when you all the planning criteria changes, going forward and and you have to retrofit some of the stuff so so to your point earlier it requires a significant investment from a capital uh, standpoint to to prepare that grid and enable it to take advantage of these devices and uh and optimize it in a way right i think you know that those are all key points and i'm just gonna like pull pull out some of the things that you said sure. to kind of tee up so main challenge is we're trying to use a machine that was designed for a certain phenomena that now is being, we're pivoting. AK going yes. for one-way power flow to two, centralized yes. generation to decentralized. And the benefit, and I think, you know, we lose sight of that because it seems like such a hindrance. But if we actually think outside the box and think differently, like we've always done as an innovative, you know, society, is these new technologies be it renewable or not, that they're smaller, they're scalable, and each one of our individual customers can have access to them. So I like to think we're going all the way back to the beginning of the grid, where the first original power users were individual customers with individual right. buildings, and they had their generation in their basement. So yep. we, I think, get lost in a lot of the terminology, and then we're competing over which one is better or which one is not, where there's enough for all of us to play. And so here we have new technologies, and it's challenging, really, how utilities look at that aged infrastructure, ensuring safe, reliable, affordable power for base performance today, while also realizing technology is moving so fast and quickly that th what can be done now to set up for the future. So there's different ways and really different perspectives of how we have to think about our capital investments. And so I guess I'll ask you, you know, what are some examples where you saw, you know, something happening within a certain territory? Because I also like to say on the podcast is every utility is a fingerprint in itself. And technically every feeder within the utilities territory is also a fingerprint. So there's no peanut butter spread, but there are right. people that have done um, really invaluable takes, creative thought within the utility space, and then drove this like idea of investing their capital, you know, with this new insight. So can you speak to any of those? Yeah, yes. I mean, no, I, I think there, there are two different kind of types of customers that, that we think about, right? So you have, you know, industrial and commercial customers and res residential customers. And I think that there have been a lot more innovative approaches that utilities have used with their uh, industrial and commercial customers, I think, to this point, because a lot of them are demanding the green power and, and some of them are actually installing some of these capabilities on their facilities. So, so how do you start integrating those different resources in, into the distribution grid right now? And, you know, we've seen a lot of the, the companies have already started uh, doing that and retrofitting some of those circuits to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, and, and even now with, with, with proliferation of some of these big data centers that are 
they're, they're asking, you know, they need a lot more load than we've had and using a lot more power. That has given them the ability to actually go and rethink completely how they're going to build the system to to service them to the level of service that they that they want. And I think we're seeing, you know, a lot better infrastructure, but also to your point, you know, we are building new control centers that can actually see that stuff. People are building ADMS systems that can actually control the flow better. They can have the visibility, they can integrate those different uh, devices uh, and, and optimize the circuit circuit flow. You know, the other piece is that as they're doing that, a lot of them are building underground systems to protect it from some of the elements that we're seeing uh, on an ongoing basis and, and increase the reliability of the system. Now that's that's a pretty expensive proposition, but they're mm-hmm. seeing that over over the years, because you rebuild it so many times, that economically it's starting to to make sense. So so there there there's a lot going on on there. But to your point before, I mean, can the customers now take themselves off the grid? Yeah, ab- absolutely. I think there's there are resources, there are ways to do it. And then what happens to the grid from a utility standpoint it becomes a backup. And if you're a backup, you better make sure that you're there when they need you because they're going to be paying some kind of access fee to your infrastructure. Uh, so it changes how we pay for the grid. It decouples the, the grid cost with the, with the energy usage, uh, but also enables these, these customers to define their own uh, system. And And the problem, I think, again, becomes... And this is the debate, right? Does the utility have a control over that customer equipment to be able to use it when it needs it? Or is that something that the customers uh, can only use and, and the utility just has to react to whatever they decide to do, uh, whether it's dispatchable or not, which is which is a big debate in a lot of different jurisdictions as well, right? And I think that's really important. You know, when we're thinking about where we've been, where we are, where we need to head, you know, I'll just say the perspective of a customer, what a utility needs to do for 24-7, 365 power right. is, you know, very complicated. However, right. if the customer becomes more aware and has a better understanding of the phenomena of the power grid, we start to have, I think, better conversations at the table where the utility that currently has the assets to serve the power. And as we transform through this revolution that we're all enduring, you know, we the utility space can become that energy advisor, right? And Absolutely. so really how to create the story and drive the awareness that we must invest in the grid to continue to provide the public service affordably to our customers That's based right. on the models that we all live within in the regulatory environment that we sit in. And so I guess there's a lot, and that's like the fun part of this podcast is talking about, you know, you mentioned C&I customers. Like some could spin the story that like they're going to go off the grid because right. the grid's not reliable or it's not resilient enough. Or if we have that conversation slightly different, you know, if the customer enables their building to become manageable in a way that helps serve the grid so that we're literally creating projects that enables the service of all. Because I think we can't think of ourselves as one individual building retrofitting it to become a microgrid where you can serve yourself. But what about the idea that that service can then be provided to the grid, which then helps the community. And those conversations is really what, what is a microgrid? It could potentially be an asset that allows this dynamic two-way interchange. And so lots of use cases of microgrids being deployed in in that exact um, scenario. And I think across you know, all of our grids, but they're just like there's every circuit's a fingerprint, every microgrid's a fingerprint. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the universities are, as you know, playing with the microgrids and, 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 you know, using them to, to learn from it. The problem with, not the problem, but just the challenge is, you know, how do you socialize some of those costs and who benefits, right. who doesn't benefit? And that's where we get into, into some of the regulatory uh, grounds where if I, as one house on the block wants to go off the grid, but my neighbor, you know, doesn't, you know, how do you create equity in the, in the whole system of making sure that everybody gets what they want when the grid, the way it feeds it, doesn't have that ability to, to differentiate. Now, with proliferation of AMIs, I think you have a little bit more ability to control who gets what, but then I go back again to how much control uh, does the 
utility have over my capability to produce? And then who, whose responsibility is to maintain that infrastructure, right? If I am the one responsible, uh, just like a tree in front of my house that is dying and I don't want to cut it down, knowing that it's going to fall on my house at some point because I don't want to spend the, the money. Uh, even if I give that access to utility, they need to know whether that system is really viable and, and, and ready to be dispatched when, when, when they want it. So, so there's, there's a lot of kind of murky waters that we need to get through to figure out who has what rights and, and when you can use some of those things. But that's the future. I mean, that, that's what, you know, that, that's where we want to be. Because to your point, if I have all this extra capacity and I can produce it and feed several you know, create a microgrid, actually disconnect it from the grid if I need to, to feed that neighborhood, that's where we eventually want to be. And uh, and I think that's that's kind of the ultimate goal of, of, of creating this grid that, that, that helps everybody. And so, you know, I think we said the word a couple of times, but what we just spoke of is murky and it kind of gets convoluted and complicated. So therefore, it's very, I think, powerful that all us in the leadership realm of the utility space and those that are educating and creating conversations, you know, it's, it's about language. So I heard you say sure. control. And so that for us is really, it's manageability, right? And okay. so like you say, yes. like, you know, nobody wants to feel as if their, their assets are going to be used without them being given some kind of value. That's right. So how do we create language and scenarios and markets and like who gets paid and when they get paid and who pays for it? It, 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 right. it becomes very murky. And so another word, like if you think about the industry as a whole, we've had reliability metrics, which Absolutely. allowed the utilities to perform and communicate to the, the commissions and the regulatory arms who are there for our customers to advocate for fair pricing, right? that they're within a certain realm of a reliability metric, Sadie, Katie, Safety. So yeah. they've been standardized, right? So there's a certain cost, like you can create the spreadsheet to understand what type and what amount of cap uh, capital, and aka ONM, but yes. can be spent to improve your metric to give you Absolutely. that. Really, it's a communication tool to those that see the grid other than when are my lights off and when are my lights on. What word I'm introducing now is a lot of utilities and a lot of external stakeholders looking in is like, what are you doing to be more resilient? That's right. Um, so I'm going to throw that over to you. You know, there's this word resiliency as well as reliability. And so how can you think, or what have you seen that we can use these new technologies, which we kind of already said earlier, and storage technologies to help support and build up resiliency? And what does the industry kind of have to do to really drive that from a capital investment perspective? What yeah, so, so re resiliency is, is, is a big word. And it started with actually, I think it was first called storm hardening. And it came out of 2004-05 you know, hurricanes in Florida that, that, that decimated the state, I think, three times within four months. And, uh, and then we, we introduced this whole concept of, hey, how do, we, how do we harden our infrastructure to withstand these things? And then resiliency, to your point, has taken a broader term. I mean, we saw some of the cyber uh, issues, you know, resiliency, being able to protect from bad actors coming into our systems and trying to control dams and stuff like that. So, so the resiliency has become a um, you know bigger concept over over the last s several years. The the reliability, you know, was was kind of the proxy for resiliency because if you really look at it, there's a huge correlation in your reliability performance and usually the the resilience, especially the weather related events. So, um, but I would say one thing around even reliability metrics have progressed. You know, if you just say, if you say to Katie, fine. But if I tell you as the customer, hey, Elizabeth, your, your safety is, is one. You'd be like, okay, but I had three outages last year. It doesn't mean anything to me. So we started mm -hmm. introducing the CIMI and CLID to, to really identify the pockets of, the cus of customers they're experiencing extreme number of outages so that we can start directing the capital to improve their service. The same thing with the, with, with the, with infrastructure and overall resiliency. We're starting to say, Hey, are the loading standards good enough now as they were 30, 40 years ago? And by the way, do you build everything new to a new standard? And how do you spend the money to retrofit to, you know, the, the stuff that is grandfathered if you want uh, right now? 
and and how do you prioritize where you're going to put first, second, and third, and how do you address some of those uh, economic issues that you have within your customer base? Uh, you know, we, we we started talking about energy equity too, right? You know, how do you start investing into the neighborhoods that actually do not have the economic right. freedom to actually put a generator in? To, to have some, uh, you know, the batteries and stuff like that. And how do you make sure that they have access to, to, to power? So, so that concept has become hugely important. And how do you make sure that those communities have energy resiliency and power resiliency built into their, their, their network? So, so it becomes, you know, to your point, it, it, it kind of grows. Uh, the, you know, that, then we have, you know, question that comes after every storm. Why do we underground the whole, whole system? Well, you know, when you start looking at the cost and stuff like that, it becomes, you know, super expensive. But over time, over 30 years, is it worth to just bite the bullet and and and, and underground it? Now, one thing that are going to bring into, in, into here is the IIJA funding is giving us a path to socialize some portion of those costs at the national level. So I know that in a lot of companies are pursuing those funds and a lot of them have received significant amount of money to help advance that resiliency program through these federal federal grants, uh, which is an opportunity for everybody to, to actually defray some of the costs to their specific customers and socialize them. In, in the, I mean, those costs have to come from somebody, right? Right. And, and I guess I'll just share, you know, with the IIJ funding, if you really dive into it, I mean, I think it's, it's, the perspective, right? Like, I think that we know that the answer to it's integrated distribution planning will answer right. all the questions that you just stated. I'm just kidding, but not really. Like, there's a roadmap, and if we're all That's speaking right. the same language of all all of the different challenges that a utility that has the assets that they're currently, you know, required to maintain are undergoing, and then weave in a process that the language we use with it can be broadly scaled across like all individual utility owners and then our stakeholders, our customers, our commissioners, our regulatory agents, those that, you know, help drive decisions. I'll just say with that funding, it really is expediting or creating the awareness in that pockets of the integrated distribution planning, which we could talk probably a whole hour sure. on that, but I'll just That's say right. there's other podcasts that mention it. And uh, you you really talked about it without, like speaking of it, like just to right. thread the dots. One thing that I want to go back, and, Elizabeth, to, to your to your point around using the right words. I think I think that's a very good point. You know, I, and I used the word control, and you corrected me. And and I think you're right. I didn't correct but, you. I just suggested. Well, no, you suggest, <laughs> but, but you're right. You know, you, you're absolutely right. It's it's how we talk about these things because to somebody telling them that I'm going to control the asset that you own is scary. But you know, if we if we present it in a way that it's going to create a bigger good, good, greater good for for their neighborhood, it's a completely different conversation. People are willing to to have a conversation. But if you get at them that I want to control your asset that you paid for, it's usually a non-starter. And I think that's a that's a very good good point and something that that I will uh, I, I will take take from this conversation, frankly. As, uh, okay. as something to be aware of. No, I mean it's, but that, that's how we. I think that that's how we enable these things, and it's it's the right conversation. How do you approach people in a way that you want to meet meet them halfway, and not that you want to take away something from them? Yeah, like it's ultimately how do we create like a win 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 right. scenario, Absolutely. right? It's it's the customer benefit, it's the financial benefit, and it's really the feasibility of the technology that's like actually being installed. There's a significant amount of noise, but if really we identify who the stakeholders are, we understand, I mean, I'm going to simplify this like incredibly, but I think it's that simple, but we like as a society to make things complicated. Yeah, that's right. We understand the needs and the goals. We create the language around it so we can identify if they're common goals and if they're not right we use communication that's open and transparent uh, also us engineers and those that have the the tools and the toolbox to help solve problems need to understand the bigger picture before they literally narrow down so really creating leadership and energy industry employees that get the bigger to be able to drive the individual understand that it's going to require innovation which is a totally Absolutely. different mindset instead of that 
that's, you know, this is how we've done it. Complacent yep. mentality. We have to be flexible. We have to ensure that's going to be sustainable and scale. So anyway, I like all of everything we talked about really comes down to how we communicate and really drive these solutions forward because they exist, but like understanding your audience and who you're trying to solve for and that there truly is a value of that capability to help with the capital investment for this very aged infrastructure that needs overhauled. And Um, education, I think customer education is huge, right? Because, you know, people come, I mean, I, I come home and I flip a switch and I expect the power to come on. And I don't really think about where that electron is coming from that is being generated at that time when I flip the switch. And and I would tell you probably 90% of the people don't, they, you know, they, they don't really they yeah. don't care. Right. And and they just teach want, it. we should teach like in kindergarten. Like, you know, you know that it's interesting. We've, we've done this stuff with the storms, right? We would t- try to explain to people why they may be out, but the neighbor next door may not be out. And people don't want to, they don't really care. They don't have the time. People are busy. People have lives. They're, they're mm-hmm. dealing with their kids. They're going to jobs and stuff. They don't have the time to take it until they don't have power. And then they're like, oh, wait a minute. How do I, how do I not have power, but my neighbor has? And then they're like, oh, now I understand it. So it's, it's how do you make this a priority for people to You need like, instead of, this, this is me just being funny, but instead of, you know, the crime watch of a neighborhood, we need like grid experts of the neighborhood watch so that everyone becomes slowly educated over time. Yeah. So there's this general respect for the complexity of our grid. Right. So, um, but, no, uh, but, Mickey, but, but, I think... but people don't realize how many things are driven by power until they don't have it. You can't go to uh-huh. a grocery store because you can't run the cash register. You can't go to the gas station because you can't pump because that thing is all. It's a, of our and it's a very um, powerful tool that we have here. I think you and I could right? talk forever. And Probably. I just want to share, thank you for sharing your invaluable insights with us today. Um, your expertise and really your knowledge has shed light on this complex and critical path that you and I get to uh, work a part, a part of and be a part of. So um, I also want to thank the listeners for continuing to tune in. I'm hoping that our discussion provided some deeper understanding and be sure that we understand the words matter. Um, And I'll just lastly say thank you, Mickey, for your time. Um, It's been great. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I can't believe the half an hour went by so fast. So thank you so much. And I guess I'm going to do a plug. Um, Don't forget to subscribe for more insightful conversations. Until next time. That's a wrap for this week's episode of the GridMod Pod. Thanks for tuning in. We hope today's conversation got you thinking about new and creative ways to improve our power grid. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to be the first to hear new episodes. This podcast is brought to you by AEIC, the place where operations leaders come together to share knowledge and provide guidance to the electric utility industry. We'll be back with a new episode soon. Until then, keep powering on.